Good morning, everybody. This is Eric. Uh, thank you for joining me. I'm going to be discussing Proposition 17 with you about the idea of giving parolees the right to vote. And we're actually going to be looking at it from two different perspectives, both legal as well as biblical. So go ahead and join me as we go and discuss this. Okay, well, let me go and dive in my notes on this and then see how this looks. Um, obviously, you can direct your attention to the proposition itself. It's, again, simply, uh, basically just uh, one paragraph with the, with the addition, a uh, slight amendment to permit parolees the right to vote, as you can see right there. And um, pursuant to that, uh, there has been... Two uh, arguments in my mind regarding it. One of them is from the law enforcement perspective, as one of them is also from the biblical perspective. Now, be, me being a Christian, obviously, my primary mandate, my overarching mandate, personally, how I vote, how I decide things, has to be first from the Bible before I ever look at the law of man. Now, that being said, uh, I'm going to take the the first argument I'm going to throw up there is going to be the, the the legal aspect of it just to get it out of the way when, when I pursue my full fleshed out uh, considerations as regards to the Bible. Okay, So, um, from a legal perspective, from a law perspective, there is the consideration of people in a parolee status can be violated or returned to prison Essentially, pretty easily. It doesn't, I mean, most of us, it's been, the statistics been thrown out there that at any given time, any one of us commit like five felonies a day without even realizing it. But for parolees, the standard to meet that is that obviously if they are found via, in violation of any crime, they can be what they call violated and sent back to prison. So the, the, the concern with this overall is that if a parolee does violate, a, uh, does violate the law, vote on the parolee stance if this proposition passes and then goes back to prison, he basically is having a, stay, uh, a say in his, in his or her own punishment, which is the concern for a lot of people. Why would we give people the, the, the right to say how they're going to be punished? Because if we look at uh, children, if we, give, we, if we give them the right to, t to say how they're going to be punished, obviously they're going to go for the, the weakest or the less intense punishment, which is... The, probably what is going through most people's minds when they look at this. But that's the legal argument. Then there's the biblical argument, which for me overshadows the legal side, because the, le the legal side in this case is about fear. What will happen if? But the biblical side is what is the standard, the principle that we should be looking at, that God himself put down, for us to be considering how we look at people who have been sent to prison and then, uh, then I release after they have fulfilled whatever the law says or requirements for an inmate to go on the parole. And then I had to, I was discussing this with several of my church elders, obviously because of the biblical perspective, well, I mean, one who has a, an intrinsic uh, background in this kind of a, uh, in this kind of a question. And he reminded me that God never provides any provision at all, for the deliberate incarceration of one of his creations of man. There is no provision. God either provides two different types of punishments. Well, kind of three, but uh, basically one of which is restitution or repayment for, for uh, theft or property damage, uh, which, good luck getting uh, re restitution to the victims in our uh, current justice system, but I'll get into that. And then there's death. The third one is exile, but emotionally exile is essentially tantamount to death, so I'm kind of, kind of combine them into two. There is no provision for long-term incarceration. You either uh, execute somebody for violation of the crime, or you mandate that they provide restitution. Like I said, exile, but that's removing them from, the, from their society, which is in effect death. All right, as far as the death penalty is concerned, I actually have a, a pretty good video going over the most of the biblical um, 
uh, crimes where death is the uh, directed penalty and go ahead and look at it uh, right up here and um, see what you think about it and uh, go from there and just consider it from the biblical perspective what they have to say on it. Now, the prison system itself was essentially designed as a way to try to impart repentance but, uh, but also because of the term penitentiary it has to do with the, uh, the word repentance but also it's just a way just to remove the undesirables from society because nobody else wanted to see it and nobody else wanted them to be around them and whatnot. So it was like, well, you're, you're putting, you're trying to remove people from society but they have no real way to pay for their crime. People try to put it out there that paying for their crime is removal from society but honestly, if anybody who sees how inmates interact in prison, they, they usually put the mentally infirm in there just to get them out of society's uh, hair, or uh, people who are uh, guilty of any kind of uh, violent crime, sex crime, rape, whatever, and then even the rapists are usually out within three to five years, which is ridiculous to begin with, especially since it's a horrendous injustice to the victim, or even murderers, get, uh, especially under our illustrious governor, who decided to sign an executive order banning all uh, death penalty, banning all executions because he didn't want to be responsible for uh, the death of another human on his watch in complete violation of the voted on uh, consequences of death penalty in this state but anyway, we're talking about parolees not the problems with our uh, with our judicial system, I'll have to go into that in another video as far as parolees are concerned ultimately the concept of a parolee, since in the Bible it does not provide for that, is almost a sense of, it's almost an exile from society, but there's no actual uh, sense of repentance for them. And that kind of thing can only really happen when they're among society, able to see the consequences of their actions, which prison doesn't allow. But in terms of this, the point of this proposition is providing parolees people who've been released from prison with the right to vote. So, let's just say we remove prison from the whole equation. If they never went to prison, if they were either executed or meant to provide restitution, they would still, if they were executed, they wouldn't have to vote anyways. But, if they were still able to be a relatively functioning member, um, relatively functioning contributing members of society, they would be able to vote to be a contributing uh, member, to be able to have a decision over their own laws, over their own leaders and whatnot. And uh, honestly, the Bible itself is, uh, we have a very unique government situation because the government doesn't really cover, our current government is not really covered in the same way as it in the Bible. It's just not the same kind of a setup. So, I have to look at the, the general principle of self-determination of an individual, giving them the right to, to either choose to sin or to not sin. So in this case, if we're eliminating the idea, the, the identity of them as being a prison inmate, and just say, okay, as a parolee left to your own devices, how would you, uh, should you be given the, the ability to make a decision towards your own future? And the only thing that I could reasonably come up with biblically was, yes, they should be allowed to have that say in how their future goes be able uh, to potentially even influence, assuming that they think about this, even influence the justice system to, towards a more biblical end. So, in this case, for Proposition 17, I would have to say that yes, parolees should be given the right to vote and be able to make long-term determinations, potentially reforming the prison system or the justice system, but really be able to work towards bettering their own life, uh, as well as... Uh, how it uh, reform the rest of society. Now, can it be possible that uh, one of those crimes that are guilty, that are uh, the consequence of death penalty, could still be carried out by a parolee? Yes. But that's true of anybody out there. Granted, parolees have a higher probability of it, in which case it would simply, they would probably end up performing the crime again be arrested and hopefully uh, terminated uh, or executed for it. So anyways, um, that's my best analysis uh, for it, biblically speaking. And like I said, go and take a look at the video uh, for um, for death penalty. I'll try to make one regarding the, the biblical uh, 
uh, focuses on restitution. So if you want to stay, uh, go ahead and subscribe to my channel and stay tuned for that. So like I said, go ahead and subscribe to my channel if you want to keep up to date as I push out more anal analysis videos on the propositions. And um, go ahead and uh, like my video if you like it, uh, so that it'll bump up that the video on the YouTube algorithm or all these videos, so more people can potentially see these videos and make a reasonable, uh, educated choice in regards to how to vote. And make sure you vote yourself, but please only vote if you do so out of educating yourself. Don't vote because some political party says it's what you got to do. Vote based off your own conscience. Because ultimately speaking, that's what the deciding factor is, not based on what your party wants. And uh, I guess I'll see you soon, and God bless.